Hey, Justin Botier, CEO of Calix CPA here. Today I'm meeting with Sean McAllister, and he is an attorney based in Colorado, and he niches, and I, from what I understand, you're fully, you fully are in the psychedelics industry. And, um, and I'm so glad that we're meeting today because as uh, you know, and many people may have heard by this time that there was a big decision by the FDA, was it the FDA, that um, decided to not al uh, allow MDMA to be uh, a Schedule 3, or, or what, what would they, what, they just did not. Yeah, let, let me, they, I can explain it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, and introduce, your, I, introduce yourself too, Sean, if you wanted to, yeah. to give people more of a formal introduction. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, no, it's nice to be with you. And I really have a lot of respect for your practice in cannabis and now in psychedelics. And we share that common background. I was a co-author of Amendment 64 in Colorado and spent 12 years primarily as a cannabis and hemp attorney and did a lot of things there, startup to exit, business, regulatory, litigation, you know, tax audits, all the things. But about seven years ago, I got really passionate about the psychedelic world and through some personal healing of my own, and really have transitioned my practice, as you said, to fully focusing on psychedelics. And so I'm not an FDA lawyer, but I am helping doctors and therapists think about getting ready for MDMA. So I'm going to mm -hmm. talk to you about that topic in just a second. But other than FDA, you know, uh, drug development work, I definitely work with doctors and therapists thinking about ketamine assisted therapy, getting them ready for MDMA therapy. And then in Colorado, I was co-author of a, uh, Prop 122, the Natural Medicine Health Act, which we're going to talk about. And I work with a lot of both doctors and therapists and then decriminalized uh, be, uh, actors in Colorado where you can do psychedelic therapy right now, or you can wait another six months and do it in the the regulated field. So again, we're going to talk about that, but I cover that area. And then I have this whole religious freedom side of what I do representing psychedelic churches, uh, including in some litigation against the U S government. And I was recently co-counsel in a case where the third ever ayahuasca church has been recognized in the United States, the church of the Eagle and Condor. Um, that's a indigenous inspired Shipibo tradition, um, you know, hybridized American practice based on Shipibo practice. And so very excited about that and how I get this sort of broad spectrum. There's so much going on in, world. in this industry, which is, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So let me talk about the FDA decision, which uh, is a big deal, because like I said, I, you know, I do a lot of basic healthcare law for doctors and therapists, like ketamine consent forms. And I do license uh, defense, licensure defense, if you get a complaint about your license as a therapist or doctor. And then also helping people think about what do I need to do to be ready for MDMA? And unfortunately, what happened yesterday is that there was a actually just a panel, okay. advisory panel to the FDA. So this wasn't like all of FDA saying, mm -hmm that MAPS is, or now it's called Lycos. Lycos is, Lycos. Mm -hmm. yeah, Lycos is MDMA is not done, but this panel said they don't believe the evidence and they want to see maybe more data, even though we've been in clinical trials for 20 plus years. Um, full disclosure, I do work for MAPS a little bit. I, the general counsel of their psychedelic science events, um, event next year, the big psychedelic science Event. So we're going to have the big meeting in Denver next year, 2025. But what this means is that at l potentially FDA could still approve MDMA in spite of this panel's recommendation. Okay. The panel recommended not to approve the drug. Okay, so that's that's good news because it, it kind of read like it was like an FDA it was an FDA decision. Yeah, so no, just a panel. But 80% of the time, the FDA adopts the panel's recommendations. Yeah. So definitely the cards are stacked against us. Mm -hmm. I think talking to my friends at MAPS, there's a decent chance they might say, well, we need some more data on X, Y, Z. Go back and do a little more work for 12 to 18 months. So it could just be a medium term slowdown of 12 to 18 months on MDMA. Or worst case scenario, they say, go back to the beginning of phase three, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. it could be two to three years out. Um, mm -hmm. I'm obviously crossing my fingers that it's only uh, an advisory yeah. decision and FDA still approves it, or at least crossing my fingers, it's only 12 to 18 months. But I think it shows the institutional resistance to psychedelic therapy because mm -hmm. the data is there. And this panel focused on a bunch of kind of uh, ethical issues. Did somebody have a video of their their uh, treatment revealed without their permission? Did somebody have a therapist touch them inappropriately? Like those are terrible things, but that's not about the efficacy. And I think they seized on a lot of these little things and uh, just showed their institutional bias against psychedelics and voted no. So it is a tough day for the industry. A lot of people are freaking out, but hopefully it won't be that big of a deal. I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it does seem like there's all, you know, I was just visiting with Courtney about the farm bill. Courtney Moran is an attorney out of um, Portland and she's a lobbyist for the hemp industry. Uh, yeah. And uh, so there's a lot of these institutional, like, it's not all about like consumer protectionism. It's not all about getting the medicine to the people, right? There's, exactly. in, there's institutions that have different, uh, they benefit or won't be, or might be hurt by MDMA. So maybe there's some, you know, some special- Well, this is part of the Special interests happening, going on, yeah. There was an insurance company nonprofit called ICER ICER that came out with a report attacking the findings. And you might say, well, why is the insurance company afraid of MDMA? Because PTSD, the official condition, is only 0.3% of all pharma drugs right now. But the concern is you open the door, people hear MDMA for PTSD, you may see off label prescriptions, you're at least going to see an increase in PTSD diagnoses because right now it's for a lot of people, it's secondary. It's not the primary thing they're treating. Um, but yeah, you just think about the conspiracy that even if it's only 20, 30, 50 million a year to cover um, MDMA, that th these insurance companies spent you know, a little bit of money on a report cast out on MDMA, and they're gonna postpone it for you know, a couple of years and save 30, 50, $100 million. So, um, so I think there is some of that in the background that that's, Part of the official story the yeah. insurance company stepped in and tried to submarine it that's that's an official that's an official <laughs> yeah okay so, great cool so so yeah i think uh did you want to talk a little, i wanted to say a couple of things about ketamine and then maybe the colorado yeah. yeah please so, do yeah i guess the point of this mdma problem is that if you were a therapist or doctor and you wanted to be fully legal the only thing you can do right now is ketamine we were all hoping for MDMA, but that looks like it's postponed. And I would say ketamine is, you know, uh, there are some obvious pitfalls there, um, but not a lot of people are getting in a lot of trouble. You know, the kind of trouble I see is when a doctor is addicted to ketamine or you're running a ketamine mill and you're not actually engaged in authentic patient uh, physician relationship. But you know, overall, I think if you do the smart things that you can work with ketamine as a doctor or therapist. For therapists, it's complicated because therapists don't practice medicine. And there is some uneasiness about therapists you know, holding space for people on ketamine because you know, if a therapist does blood pressure, are they doing medical treatments? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just encourage people, especially therapists, to think hard about this and the safest thing would be ketamine in a doctor's office with medical supervision. California uh, therapy regulator did this article on it, and they said that the least safe thing is like telehealth ketamine, where you're not present with the patient, there's no medical monitoring. So that is just a super quick on ketamine to say it is legal, there are some complexities. In addition to doctors and therapists, I have you know, harm reduction trip sitters that are just sitting with people on ketamine. So people can get ketamine diagnosed or, you know, prescribed, they get their own ketamine from the pharmacist, they self-administer. And then I think it is legal for somebody to be a trip sitter or a harm reductionist and be present to try to reduce harm. But, you know, then you're getting into a lot of issues about liability releases and yeah, you need a CPA to 
make sure you're reporting the income correctly and uh, thinking through all those issues. So I was very skeptical of ketamine, but I've tried it a few times and I can say it is a very powerful, uh, even though it's a disassociative, I feel it's a very psychedelic experience and there does come with a lot of uh, kind of mental reset and healing there. So I think people should think more about that. There are opportunities there, not only as a doctor and therapist, but as a harm reductionist um, and as a patient. So don't forget ketamine and the whole thing. It's a, it's a good, I've, you know, what I've, I've learned over the years is that it's a good entry point too, to be, be, in, right. I mean, cause it, it is a schedule three, it's not a schedule one. Um, yeah. How would, how would a person go and be prescribed ketamine? Like who, who, what type of person would you need to go f seek out for, for, to get a, a prescription? And then, and then, uh, and then now with, in Oregon, at least we've got any number of uh, trained uh, facilitators that probably would be fine with, right. with somebody who actually has a little bit of training that could sit with you while you're, having the the ketamine experience but what but as yeah, like something you right. can, where would i go for example yeah any uh medical professional with prescribing authority so it's not all medical professionals but certainly doctors nurse practitioners physicians assistants uh psychiatrists you know, it's kind of open because the prescriptions are off label. Generally, the ketamine is only approved for anesthesia. So all mm. the mental health treatments are experimental and off label. So you have to find a doctor willing to, you know, uh, mm. be comfortable with off label prescription, which mm. frankly, I think 70% of our drugs are prescribed off label in America. So it's a very common mm. practice, but, but yeah, some doctors might be resistant, but any typical uh, psychiatrist or pain doctor or uh, maybe a nurse practitioner or physician assistant. And so that's where there has to be a team here. If you're going to be a, a therapist and sit with somebody on ketamine, you probably need a prescribing physician or NP to work with you, make the prescription, and you do the sitting. Uh, by no. the way, this is an example of therapist and also uh, harm reduction sitters, facilitators in Oregon. They shouldn't be saying to people, well, I think you could use a extra dose, you know, halfway through, maybe you redose. Right. That's kind of the practice of medicine. So you should avoid as you're if you're non-prescribing physician, you shouldn't be deciding how much ketamine the person needs. Mm -hmm. They need to be following the recommendations of their doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So there's little pitfalls like that, right? Yeah. I mean, I know there's uh there are ketamine practitioners that will will prescribe like you meet them online and they'll prescribe and then yes. they'll sit with you via Zoom or whatnot. But certainly having that like that presence in the same room would be uh, having a guide or someone who can be with you uh, during that. Experience. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that unsupervised at home yeah. use because, again, some people have cardiac issues and, sure. you know, that's why the risk of this, it, it's higher when it's unsupervised. So you're right. I you haven't, I've heard more than stuff. once people overdosing or drinking while on ketamine or several oh people, gosh. I've heard several people like, don't get into a hot tub on ketamine. Like that seems like where it always goes bad. Like God, people, Matthew people Perry is killing us. That, and, and I've heard that more than a couple of times. So yeah, yeah, I mean, not to scare people from using it. I think that like anything needs to be um, handled with care, yeah. but uh no, that's a great advice. I mean, I, I think it is a party drug also. I don't know how anybody dances on ketamine. That sounds crazy to me, but it, there are risks. And that's the point about having proper medical monitoring or a facilitator yeah. or somebody present. So and it could be addictive too. There is addiction to ketamine. So you got to watch out. Yeah. yeah, very good. Very good. Well, thanks for the, thanks for the insights on that too. And, and that is, and it is a schedule three, it is legal and people can. Correct. And, and so I don't know if this is a good way to transition, but like, I do know that you, I heard you speak uh, at a conference not too long ago, and you were talking about Colorado's uh, decriminalization rules. And I thought that was fascinating what Colorado has done in terms of uh, how, yeah. rolling out um, the decriminalization, but then at the same time, working on the regulated uh, industry. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, and this is where Oregon, Colorado have this nice trampoline bounce effect between us, right? Like Denver decrims mushrooms in 2019. You guys decrim statewide in 20, or you create a regulated model and decrim. Yeah, we had decriminalization. We we reversed that. I don't know what we're thinking. We need to re we need to re decriminalize psychedelics. I don't know about the other ones, but that one agree totally. That, agree. Two steps forward, two steps back. And yeah, but here's this trampoline bounce. So you guys create regulated psilocybin. Your decrim was kind of messed up to begin with because mm -hmm. it wasn't fully decrimmed. You still could technically be guilty yeah. of a crime. You just couldn't go to jail. And yeah. now you've recrimmed. But so we took your progress and we said, <laughs> yes, we'll have regulated psilocybin, which is coming yeah. in 2025. But then the decrim side, we went full hog. And we didn't listen to the haters and the doubters and the in the active or the uh, funder community, which is probably what got you guys limited to a certain extent. And we we went full decrim, meaning not only can you not go to jail, but you can't even be arrested in Colorado for possessing, cultivating, and sharing uh, three of the four psychedelics: psilocybin, DMT, and and mescaline, other than peyote. All of us can possess, cultivate, and share. We can also all possess and cultivate iboga, but the legislature took our ability to, to share that away due to risk concerns. But so here we have four psychedelics basically decrim. And then to your point, like we went farther than Oregon because we said it's legal to share. You know, that is still a crime in every other state. It, even with no money, it's, a, it's usually a crime of some kind in every state to, to share Schedule One drugs. Mm -hmm. So what that means, we also, you know, snuck in a thing because a lot of us who wrote the initiative were came from the world of uh, healing ceremonies and sitting in circles and finding a spiritual experience. So we said you could share natural medicines and be paid for bona fide harm reduction services and bona fide support services. So yeah. here is the biggest opportunity in America in a decriminalized, unregulated environment to come to Colorado, there's no residency restriction from Oregon or from Colorado or wherever. Um, and you have to give away medicine for free. So you can't sell mushrooms or mescaline or DMT, but you could give those away for free and charge for those bona fide harm reduction services. And you've got black and white letter law saying that's legal. I could show you the statute. And if anybody ever said, what are you doing charging for this weekend ayahuasca retreat? Um, you could say, here's the law that says I can charge for bona fide harm reduction services like trip sitting, counseling. Uh, we have these categories that are a little vague, of course, but uh, beneficial community-based use and healing. You know, the, the phrase was about we're sitting in a circle and we're healing and that's legal. I'm charging for that's the service we're providing. Um, and uh, and then supported use, a very broad term. So maybe supported use is. Well, uh, yeah, at this point, at this point, anybody who's listening to this and when yes. I listen to your presentation, my mind was just blown at that point. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. Because, because I know like, at least in the cannabis industry to like get out of 280E and all that stuff. It was just kind of a strategy for people to sell the, sell the stickers, but give away the cannabis. And right. that was like, well, I'm not selling cannabis. I'm giving it away, but I'm selling the sticker. And that was like, no, that doesn't work, you know, but here we have a state that's saying, no, this is exactly how it works. And, um, and I think that I, exactly. It's it's legit, and I'm I'm super excited to to hear that. I I would be curious how it rolls out with the regulated market, but but let's go back to what you were going to say the support the supported service that you were talking about. Well, yeah, remember these are examples of bona fide harm reduction and bona fide support services. So we put the word bona fide in there. So okay. to your point about the sticker, I tell people, look, you can't come here and sell the sticker and give away the mushroom. There's nothing about a sticker that's a bona fide harm reduction service. Good, good, good. But you really have to get your mind into, out of this, sell a t-shirt, give away mushroom, sell a, a sticker, and say, what is the harm reduction service I'm providing? And that's where, again, you gotta be thinking, 
therapy, spiritual guidance, yes. supportive use, trip sitting, uh, a retreat with, you know, you're not charging for the medicine, you're charging for the overhead of the rooms and the food and the services people are receiving. And, and that's why there, you know, there is some legitimacy to this because like you said, on the 280E side, you can say I'm not selling mushrooms. So there is a nice 280E explanation here. Um, well, that's the, that's what's new. beautiful about the psychedelic industry and, and how yeah. it's just it's a serve it's more of a service that people are contracting or paying for. And the and the sale of the mushrooms or or the, the psychedelic is so much smaller than that in terms of like that's just exactly. a very small part. And, and it's not like a dispensary where people are always just rolling in for their for their ounces every couple of days or whatever. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Really, it the, it seems to be like ninety percent of it seems to be on this like mental health or healing or spiritual exploration kind of side of things, and not like recreational. Like you're, you know, like some like cannabis. Yeah. Diet. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree very with that. In the healing center side, for you guys, service centers, that yeah, ninety-five percent of the cost is about the service, and we're really in the service industry in these service centers or healing centers in Colorado, uh, and that is the way people need to be thinking about it in the decrim world. And so, you know, look, I've got these people in Colorado that they have microdosing clubs, and if you pay forty dollars, you get an eighth a month, and if you pay eighty dollars, you get a quarter a month. And I, I think those people are very vulnerable. It looks like you're selling mushrooms. So you really need to come up with an explanation that fits the black letter of the law. But that's why I think you're having me on here today as I'm spreading the gospel that there is this opportunity in Colorado. It's a window. The legislature could take it away from us at any point. So I don't want people to be reckless. But, you know, they haven't done a lot on the enforcement side here there was a guy um, who put an ad on the back of the, of the local A&E magazine, the arts and entertainment magazine that said psilocybin dispensary, kind of like the shroom house in Portland right out of the gate. And that guy got a cease and desist letter from the attorney general saying you can't advertise because that's one of the restrictions on this deep crim side. You're not supposed to advertise the sharing of natural medicine and being paid for services. So that's where people hire me to figure out what does that mean and how do I get around that? But but there's an example of even in that guy's case, when he said mushroom dispensary, he didn't get arrested. He didn't go to jail. He got told to stop doing that. So I think we have a very tolerant environment. If you're thinking about the details and you're trying to follow the rules, um, you know, I think it's going to be the worst actors that get in trouble. But, you know, we know that people exploit these laws and I've talked to people all over the West Coast that are shipping, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month um, nationwide on mushrooms, and uh, they're in a decrim city in California, but they, they think somehow they're protected. But you know, if you ship mushrooms from Southern Oregon to Idaho in the mail, you could have an, you know, Idaho or federal guy show up at your door. So. The only way to do this stuff, I'm going to loop in my other expertise. If you want to be federally and state legal, it would be a religious organization. But then you get into the brain damage of, am I really a church? Where's my service? What's my doctrine? How do I charge for church services? So it's a very complicated dialogue. Um, but yeah, you know, my bias and preference here is that all these substances are not evil and you know i i love helping people get it out there um if it was my choice it'd all be legal but um, we're trying to advise people on how to protect themselves and it's kind of a spectrum you know if you want no risk you're not going to play in any of these these little pools at all you're going to stay out of it but there is risk but hopefully if you're smart you can minimize the risk work with professionals like you and i yeah, and yeah. Uh, not be in a position where you're being accused of any kind of crime mm -hmm. yeah. or tax evasion. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's the? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, that was that was awesome. That's why that's why I wanted to to have you to to get you on a meeting. So I really appreciate it. Um, I think we could probably go back and forth all day long, but. Um, Let's connect sometime again. And uh, 
are, I think, are you going to be speaking at um, the, the Psycon uh, in Denver? I don't think so. I think uh, one of my lawyers is going to talk there, Matt Brockmeyer. But okay. um, yeah, I visited with Matt. Yeah, for sure. I, um, yeah, no, I think the other thing to know is that uh, because MDMA looks like it's slowed down, yeah. let's find a way for local decriminalization or religious use of MDMA because, yeah, I mean, there's so much underground work with that right now. It would be a shame if we're delayed three, four years on this. And uh, I hope Oregon and California, that the last bill in California would have included MDMA in this regulated space. Yeah. So I am still hopeful there's a place for MDMA and yeah. maybe even the first time for MDMA church. We'll see. Well, I, I, I definitely am, am for getting the medicine out there as quickly as possible, but I can do, I do see how people who are entering the regulated, the state regulated market could, it is going to benefit from more of a slower rollout. Um, yeah. That's, I mean, so there's the silver lining for them. Uh, but uh, yeah, hey, yeah. Thank cool, you man. So much, son. And can, how it's can best. people reach out to you? Uh, what's your McAllisterLawOffice.com. Search Sean McAllister. Search psychedelic lawyer. I'm probably at least in Colorado. I'm the number one Google result on psychedelic lawyer. So easy to find. Uh, and yeah, same with you. Um, anybody who's thinking about getting into psychedelics or cannabis, you need a lawyer. You need a CPA. Someday you're going to need insurance. Uh, you're going to need these basic business uh, sidebars. So appreciate your clients listening and thanks for the time.